May we always pray for one another, both in this world and in the world to come. Bene adventistis ad colloquium nomine pints with Jack. Oremus semper pro in vicem. Ecce pas prima, episodi, un devicesimi, in siri septima, ubi der pistlis latinis quasias loits scripsit discernus. <laughs> Dear Pints with Jack listeners, thank you for downloading this episode of Pints with Jack, the podcast where we discuss the work of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're reading some of Lewis's letters, which have been brought together in several different collections. Thus far, we've read Letters to an American Lady and Letters to Children. And this month, we began the Latin letters of C.S. Lewis. Last week, discussing the first seven letters of the correspondence, covering the years from 1947 to 1948. And today, we're going to continue all the way up to 1953, seeing the friendship blossom between Jack and his delectissime parter, his dearest father, Don Giovanni, with the constant assurances from each other that they always pray for each other. Oremus semper pro in vicem. All blessings, Andrew, David, and Matt. Hey, gents. How's the wedding planning going, Matt? <laughs> Oh, we will know a lot right after this call. <laughs> so, I mean, it's going well. We think we think we might have found a venue. Uh, we got to get a little bit of dispensation from a priest, and I need to do a little haggling with them, try to work my magic. Uh, so that's, <laughs> oh, that's, dear. That's, that's the call that I have after this. <laughs> but it's just been really lovely to be able to uh, to do this. We've got the Excel spreadsheet made my and word. tailored to our timetable of like the 75 tasks, how you complete them at what time frame in a five to six month window. Okay. And so it's kind of like running a podcast. <laughs> really, David? I mean, you know, I got <laughs> inspiration from you of how you do that. I should have built a Trello board. Uh, really? Yeah. Not too late. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess it will be, I mean, it, autopilot's a really strong word, but I guess it's just going to be now execution. That's really good. Yeah. I think I think a lot of people try and push all of the decisions late. I think mm. try and make as many of them up front as you can and then just start working down them. Once you once you've got the church and the venue, everything else just falls out. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that Chris and I did, uh, we we did our site on the knot, um, K N O T, and that was really helpful. Um, and then somewhere along the way, something encouraged us to kind of look at our, you know. What is our theme? What are the three words that we want to describe our wedding? So then we were able to use those words. I think beautiful and holy, and then I don't know, um, friendly or something like that. You know, it was, it was it was something like that. And so then when we had to decide, okay, what do we do with our invite list, or what do we do with you know, are we going to have this decoration, this cake, whatever? Um, we went back to what are our three guiding principles, and that was really helpful. Um, because you got a thousand decisions to make. <laughs> I'm kind of convinced the wedding industrial complex exists around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're trying to just ask ourselves, how can we, kind of what you're saying, Andrew, first principles and really sure. bring that into this. And then you start realizing if you deviate from mm -hmm. the norm, oh, boy. a huge more amount of work falls on your shoulders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> you become a, it, it, it is yeah. like 10 times, it's, it's, it's more um, costly, but it's also easier. Just like, all right, just pick your vendor, pick this, bring it all together, get that. Yeah. Versus, how do we get really creative and try to? You know, I don't know. I, I've just kind yeah. of noticed that there's there's a desire to try to think through from like a first principles perspective, authentically yeah. Catholic, really make this beautiful honor to Lord in this, and then then you start doing the research and all of the stuff you got to pull together, and you're like, sure. oh, you know, just follow this template. Sure. <laughs> Well, and one of the things we did too, um, we we had to make it affordable because we were, you know, on the salaries that we were on, and that created some tough decisions. But also, like our wedding um, kind of coordinator decorator, um, we said, "Here's our budget. We've got this amount to pay, you know, and this is what the, the vibe we're going for." And we went and toured her warehouse and everything, and so. Um, she's like, oh, I totally get it. And I love it. And she was a family friend. You know, I think Kristen had taught her kids. Um, and we said, you know, this is this is as much as we can pay. And she threw in a ton of stuff that we didn't ask for, kind of be mostly because she was into the idea. But what I mean was I wasn't trying to depend on the kindness of strangers. But we stuck with our thing. And then miraculously, people kind of contributed this, contributed that. 
you know, the family singing group had some trade with some companies. And so we, you know, we were able to keep it more or less on budget. So, so sticking with those and then making those difficult decisions and no wedding is perfect. Um, and, and mostly it's the inauguration of hopefully a, a, a beautiful and lifelong marriage. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I'd like to personally thank Gavin Newsom for his increasing restrictions, which made my wedding cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as fewer and fewer people could attend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, That's, Gav. <laughs> that is the hardest part. I mean, we 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 don't know if this venue will be ultimately where we come through, but there is a, just a, a natural capacity constraint. It's not super debilitating um, or constraining, but it definitely is where you got to make some tough decisions and you're like, huh. How do I, how would I tell this person or this individual or, you know, sorry, you know, I, I love you, but you don't make the cut. Yeah. Uh, I would just say, I would start by saying, I don't really love you that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying indirectly. <laughs> well, I, I've promised all of our patron supporters that they can come to your wedding. So you're going to disappoint yeah. a lot of people, Matt. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up. I did see, uh, I did just notice that actually this morning I opened Slack and saw some people kind of, I think, half jokingly about that. But we should do a a sort of just our own celebration virtually with some cocktails and stuff. It would be fun sure. to have like a sure. uh, Pintra Jack Patreon reception yeah. where we all get on and <laughs> it could just be really fun. I would yeah. I would love that. Absolutely. Well, and one of the things Chris and I did, we got married in Sarasota because that's where all her family and friends were. Um, but I've got, I had so many friends in Houston. And so a couple weeks after the wedding, some friends of ours hosted a reception. And, um, so it was another whole nother round and we did a cake and we did, you know, we had champagne, I think, and, and, and people showed up and that was, that allowed us to invite a whole lot more people, um, without asking them to travel. And so maybe doing a couple of those, um, you know, wherever your family or your main, you know, are you guys getting married in DC area? That is the hope in the base case. Okay. Yes. All right. I mean, we thought about what to do, you know, about that, and that that turned out to be a really nice, uh, a really nice event. So it it didn't obligate people to think about, you know, flying and hotels and all the rest. Um, and so it allowed them to come local and allowed us to see them in more casually, and that was great. I love it. Well, what's everyone drinking today? I got a late flight in last night from Chicago, so I have the strongest cup of tea known to man. How about you two? <laughs> well, I had dropped my London mug from Starbucks, um, and it shattered. Mm. And so I got a new London mug from Starbucks. And so I am drinking my typical coffee, you know, and then there's uh, Big Ben and Westminster Abbey right there. So cheers. What about you, Ben? I have the typical coffee, but because I felt like David was upping his game, I ended up buying a, a pack of non-alcoholic Guinness beer. Oh, wow. So I can now drink this beer in the morning. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, you need to have that glass. No, you need to pour that into a glass so you get the right head. There we go. Now I sadly oh. don't have, this is terrible to say, I do not have a- a pints with Jack beer <sighs> mug or anything like that. I don't have a beer stein or anything. I have the scotch ones. I've always done the scotch ones because that's just me. So All this right, is I'll get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we do them, I want an imperial pint glass. This is so tasty though. It's got that little yeah. ball in it that they do to help for freshness. Yeah. Excellent. So Matt, do our toast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like looking ahead and skipped this on my notes. Um, today we're going to be toasting Jeremy. Warburton. And Jeremy, we just want you to know that we continue to pray for all of our Patreon supporters, including yourself. And so we raise a glass to you uh, that you know that we pray for you and we ask that you pray for us on this side of life and in the next life. Cheers. 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 So our first letter today is from the 10th of August, 1948. Lewis begins by addressing the political situation in Italy and England, uh, and judging England to be in the worst state. Uh, he speaks about the Italian atheistic, he calls them lefties, and he calls them your sinisters, or sinistrales in <laughs> Latin. And I think there's a bit of a joke there, uh, because the Latin word... Sinistralis, it yes. means left, on the, on the left-hand yes. side. 
And even in the days of the Romans, it had already taken on nefarious connotations as being wrong, unfavorable, injurious, or perverse. So sorry to all of the left-handed listeners. It's just the opinion of the Romans. <laughs> but yeah, when he's referring to, to these lefties, I think he's talking about the Italian Communist Party and the Italian Socialist Party, the PCI and PSI. And he calls them, they're, they're wolves, and they are very obviously wolves. Whereas he says in England, the wolves aren't so obvious. They're in sheep's clothing. And he actually goes a step further and says that they might not even realize that they're wolves. The next couple of quotations are, would be good to keep in mind, given that we have an election year both in the UK and in the US. Of those who work in justice and politics, many say they are building the kingdom of God. Not do they merely say it, they perhaps believe it. For we do not have the ability to read hearts, and charity does not ascribe to malice that which can result from simple foolishness and ignorance. It beareth all things, it believeth all things. Hmm. And he goes on to say, To me, nothing in this state of affairs seems more grievous than the struggle against hatred in which we are daily engaged. I will not say hatred of enemies, but against our own people. Yeah. And against this rather grim outlook, he remembers the words of St. Paul that no temptation has befallen you except that which is common to all men. So this is, this is something that we've always kind of struggled with. Well, and we're recording this the night after the State of the Union. Um, and we are. I, 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 was, I was oblivious. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you, you didn't miss much besides rancor. And we've come to expect rancor. And it just... I would encourage our listeners, especially this year as we face a political, now a fairly political certainty about the election, the enemy wants us to break the second commandment, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the enemy is mm -hmm. working full time in our political system. And there are two different economies. There's a heavenly economy that calls us to love our enemies and love our own, oh. as Lewis points out. And there's a devilish economy that is at work in our country. And uh, I would just, I would just encourage all of us to be aware of not only hardness of heart, but sharpness of words or even tone. Um, even what we delight in. If I see something ridiculing my enemy, and I take even small a small chuckle out of that, that's not a great sign. And so let's continue to build the kingdom of heaven, whereby we love one another, um, especially our enemies, and we can only do that with the help of Christ, especially in this coming season. But let. Let us who are believers, you know, make that a triumph here. And that's you know, certainly what Lewis is addressing in the letters. And it's nice to know that nothing has changed in almost, you know, 80 years. <laughs> well, let me share two comments around to that. That's beautiful, Andrew. And I love that. I, I, I think Lewis gives some advice for this and I ought to add a point. The first advice he gives is, I think that quote, I've always loved it, do not attribute to malice, which can be simple foolishness and ignorance. Mm -hmm. How often do we assume someone with opposite values of ours or against what we believe to be truth mm -hmm. are like the most malicious, hateful people ever? Sure. And in reality, we don't know their journey. We don't know the influence that they've had. We don't know their heart. We don't know what has led them to this. And so I think that's just a really good principle to follow. The second thing I would say is spend time. Don't isolate yourself from other individuals with different values. Obviously, you can't control whether they're willing to to be friends with you. I know a lot of times, unfortunately, political values prevent people from ever becoming even friends, entering relationship. But having a human humanization of people with different values, I think, is incredibly liberating. I, I'm yes. I think of a couple people that I I really would love to emulate: Sister Miriam James and uh, Jason Everett. Okay. He speaks about he was really big in chastity uh, talks, but he's really turned himself towards the transgender issue with with kids and. He just, he speaks so beautifully. That's a very charging issue on both sides. And when he speaks of it, you know, he comes from obviously the Catholic values in that this is against truth, but he does it so beautifully and he doesn't mm -hmm. like speak negatively of the other of the side or people going through it. He talks with them. He meets with them. He loves them. He hears their story. He wants to understand this. You know, these are humans. And so I've loved, Sister Miriam James does that too. She was on podcasts and people will try to bring up political issues. And she just says, you know, she speaks with just such a heart and kindness towards individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, just a couple of thoughts, but just kind of mm -hmm. seconding what you said, Andrew. Well, I keep going back to mere Christianity where Lewis says that the real test is, let's say you read atrocities about atrocities committed by our enemies. 
And then you find something that lends you to believe that those atrocities aren't quite so bad. Are you disappointed or are you glad? Right? And it's in the later on in that same passage, it's, you know, um, one is beginning to wish the black was a little blacker. Right? And so when my enemies do something bad, do I really mourn? And do I, um, when they tarnish the image of God in themselves, do I, do I mourn for that and pray all the more for them? Or do I glee in that? And do I share the post that, that, that ridicules my enemies? Or if I see them doing something good, how quick am I to point it out? I'm very quick to point out how my friends are doing good. And I'm very quick to point out how those who irritate me are doing bad. And Christianity calls us to, to, to switch that. You know, when my, when my friends are doing something that's a little less than great, I should be quick to point that out rather than, than, than cover that over. Or not even so much my friends. I should be merciless with my own sins, you know, and, uh, and, and generous with, uh, with my enemies. So given the troublesome situation in both Italy and England, Lewis ends with this piece of advice. We ought to give thanks for all fortune. If it is good, because it is good. If it is bad, because it works in us patience, humility, and mm -hmm. the contempt of this world and the hope of our eternal country. And in episode 22 of this season in Jack's Bookshelf, I am going to be speaking to Dr. Michael Dauphiné about Boethius. And I, the opening quotation for that episode is from the Constellation of Philosophy, where Boethius writes something very similar. He says, all fortune is good fortune, for it either rewards, disciplines, amends, or punishes, and so is either useful or just. Hmm. Well, and I can't help but think about Lewis saying that his the crowds at Cambridge um, were never smaller, and he said, it must be frightfully good for me. You know, that idea that any adversity can be frightfully good for us, and uh, it, that's black belt judo um, Christianity right there <laughs> to, try to, to try to figure all of that out. Yeah. This was one of my favorite points that's been coming out in the letters of Lewis. Anne is potentially like one of the number one things to strive for in your spiritual mm -hmm. journey. Imagine going through life and looking at all things as good, mm -hmm. whether they're good <laughs> objectively <laughs> or bad from a worldly perspective, suffering wise. You know, it just it it can be all used for the good. And honestly, it's been really helping me in life and I want to strive for this. And so I just think that's so beautiful. And I love how he's he said before in a different area. You know, we should pray for the virtue to handle the good times and the bad times. Mm -hmm. And I find that so beautiful, the wisdom in that. So this is just a phenomenal point that, to be honest, I haven't seen like directly in some of his works. Um, yeah. So it's been fun to get this from the letters. Yeah, it's in the it's in the background. Well, and some of that is he's working his way there. It's 48 when he says this, and then it's frightfully good, I think, is in 1955 or something like that. So he and he's got Minto. Minto's, you know, kind of worsening and her death in between this. And he's got his cab horse tiredness and his feeling that all of his books are over. But even if things are going downhill, which they will for every human being, we all, we run out. Um, he's giving thanks and, and preparing his heart in advance to lift up his heart in the, in the face of unpleasant circumstances and welcome them as the way that the Lord seems to be guiding me today. Now, it's easy to say that, but God give us the grace to live that out. Amen? Amen. And Matt, it's good that you want to grow in this because I can assure you that marriage is a very fertile field for growing in. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you marry so far above yourself as you are about to. Yes, absolutely. Oh, 100%. And we both know some verses of that song. <laughs> About five months later, Lewis sends another letter. St. Giovanni had written to him on Christmas Day, and it's a gesture that seems to have really touched Lewis, the fact that on that feast day he had thought of him. And in this letter, there's a feature that we're going to see throughout these letters, an assurance of prayer. And that's why this episode was titled Oremus Semper Pro in Vicem, uh, let us uh, always pray for each other. And there's this, this wonderful line expressing that sentiment, coupled with this delightful hope. Do not doubt that you hold your accustomed place in my prayers. Now indeed, mountains and seas divide us, nor do I know your appearance in the body. On some day hereafter, in the resurrection mm -hmm. of the body, and in that renewal beyond all telling, God grant that we may meet. Mm. It's just a one, wonderful idea of these two men meeting in glory someday. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe recognizing something in the in the the new bodies that they've been given. It's like, is that is that Jack? Is that Don? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you guys make of Lewis's assessment of his work and vocation in this letter? I didn't really give that a lot of a lot of thought other than that point I was kind of making earlier that I just find his disposition so incredibly beautiful. It's almost like he didn't actually, and we talked about this in in last week, he did have a very good sense of his vocation. I I, I gotta be careful what I'm about to say here. But he also got a sense of his bigger vocation, which is just to do God's will. And Mm -hmm. so there's like two levels to this. This one we're seeing, I think, the higher order thinking of it, where maybe his vocation can change in a different season of his life. Um, and, and can turn. And he was just very open to that. And I think you see that here. And it's so incredibly beautiful. I mean, all my comments in this one were just reading quotes that you've already brought up, David, <laughs> that I think were incredibly beautiful. I mean, if it shall please God and write more books, <laughs> blessed be. If it shall not, again, blessed be he. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, that's pretty much the whole podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's us I mean, responding I, I, to David's I, brilliance. I, well, I, I just mean like you say that too in, a, in a, like a joking way, but like if you look at most of my comments are just me stating this was a beautiful paragraph. Yeah. Like I don't really have a lot of commentary. It was just so stunningly beautiful of a disposition and it's it's admirable. Yeah. One of the things I, I recognized um, if probably really for the first time when we did Letters to an American Lady and then again Letters to Children because both of those draw to a close at the end of Lewis's life. And we have this sense of Lewis being not a very old man, a still relatively young man at age not even 64 when he dies. Um, but his sense that I have completed my work, I'm done, you know, and I picked some of this up in the biography work that I've been doing on Joy Davidman. He's got 14 years left. And he's got 14 years worth of task left. And so it seems like I mean, Warney lived for another 10 years after Jack died. I mean, Warney was 12 or 13 years, you know, he was two years older than Jack. And so I think that you have this sense of the divine orchestration and he's beginning to wear down, but he's also looking forward to a time of great refreshment, even though he doesn't know it. So Narnia is coming. Joy is coming. Cambridge is all coming. He can't see any of that. Warney is drinking a fair bit. Minto is, um, is I think, losing her mind a little bit. Um, and he's also suffered the defeat, you know, the Anscombe debate and all the rest. And so he's turning from writing apologetics to writing creatively. And so it's a real time of transition for him. And, and Charles Williams has died. Um, and the Inklings are about to break apart. So it's a great time of loss. Small wonder that he would, uh, he would feel this. I think that for, for ourselves, we should pay attention to the circumstances of our life. Sometimes how I feel is just directly related to what I'm going through and not necessarily anything higher than that. And so taking a step back and looking at that perspective can help us to, you know, kind of give thanks and realize, okay, I'm going through a difficult time. It should be difficult. And I'm glad that he's got a confessor to talk to about. How about all of these things? And in the screw tape letters, he'll speak about the law of undulation, about things go up, yes. things go down. And yep. certainly in this period, he, he's feeling feeling the weight of the world upon him. He describes himself mm-hmm. as dwelling in the tents of Kedar, uh, mm-hmm. which I, I'm actually genuinely impressed, actually, the number of very subtle scriptural references he just weaves throughout. So that comes from yep. Psalm 120, uh, and mm-hmm. it's a reference to living among hostile people. And I, I think... Mm-hmm. I think actually probably the Book of Common Prayer has got a lot to answer for in terms of his his just dropping these in because he's praying these very regularly. Um, you you can mm-hmm. I often find that you can tell if somebody prays uh, the Divine Office, the you know matins or vespers or even song regularly because their language tends to start becoming peppered with particular psalms. Mm-hmm. What do you make of the mention by Don Giovanni of these little big men that Lewis refers to? Uh, Lewis says they threaten much, they promise much, and equally perhaps in vain. I'm not altogether sure. I think it probably deals with the the political situation in Italy. Um, mm. And of course, Italy's government has always been um, fairly unstable. You know, how many prime ministers have they been through since the since the end of the war? Um, and so there's, you know, people are positioning themselves. We certainly see the rise of the mafia around this time. You know, and so there's some unrest and some power grabbing, I think, and that may be that may be it. But somebody who knows history um, better than I probably has a better comment. Mm. That that was my take as well. 
Yeah. And there's another theme that, that runs through, particularly the set of letters that we're going through today, is about the situation in the world and it sort of falling apart. And Lewis keeps coming back to, uh, well, what's the Christian response? And in this letter, he says, concern for the future distresses mortal minds in vain. Their screw tape. <laughs> and then, and then he says, "Our response should be, how long, Lord? Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. On, let, let, let's mm-hmm. let's wrap all of this up." Mm-hmm. <laughs> the next letter is from Don Giovanni. We don't get too many of those in this mm-hmm. collection. Uh, it's on the seventeenth of April, nineteen forty-nine. Earlier, he sent a letter on the feast of the Nativity, and this letter was sent on Easter Day. So he's being very mm-hmm. liturgical with Lewis. <laughs> Matt, you had some thoughts on this one. Well, yeah, this was another one where I'm not sure their thoughts other than I put just a beautiful paragraph, another beautiful paragraph. So I just <laughs> loved, let me read some of them. May the grace and peace of Christ exalt in your heart the appointed days draw near in which we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. My thoughts are daily towards you and especially in these days of prayerful good wishes for brothers and friends. Mm. Mm. And then just... May good times come. The voice of God indeed daily calls to us, calls to the world to abandon sins and seek the kingdom of God wholeheartedly. Mm. Oh, that we may all hear the call of the Father and sometime at last be converted to the Lord. May the Lord Jesus grant that in these days of his resurrection, after his passion and death for us, we are able to assist the human family to be raised up in the newness of life of Christ our Lord. Mm. And then finally, at the foot of the crucified one, I have composed this letter. That was actually probably my favorite, despite being so mm. short. At the foot of the crucified one. Mm, so beautiful. Yeah. He uses that phrase quite a bit. I am actually of the opinion, I think he's writing these letters while in church, in front of the tabernacle, in front of the Eucharist. Because he uses this phrase a lot. And I have a suspicion that it's certainly some kind of devotion, whether you know it's it's in front of a particular crucifix in in his room uh, or in church in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I do think it's wonderful that that's the context in which these letters get written. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that line also, you will read in my heart all that I would have said to you had health permitted. He's saying, you know, mm. we, we know each other and you know I would, just, I would pour out even more if my health was better and I had more energy to be able to to write in the way that I want to. Mm-hmm. There's a real loving spirit between the two. And I imagine that must have been so refreshing for Lewis. You know, I imagine he got a lot of letters asking for things or, you know, but this kind of purely spiritual conversation, I think that, um, especially from religious, and I've mentioned before, when he has conversation with with religious um, with people with religious vocation, he's a lot more vulnerable. And I think that there's an openness to, uh, to, to what St. Giovanni is saying to him. Mm. I, I would clarify that just a little bit. I think it, he, expressed mm-hmm. it, he expresses the fact that he's feeling emotions much more readily. It's not so much the content that he's always revealing more particular details about his life, but he's expressing desolation when he's feeling desolation. Whereas mm-hmm. when he's writing to the general public, he he gives hints of it, and he and he is, I think actually sometimes surprisingly vulnerable with people. But there there is there is a consistent tone when he's writing to Don Giovanni or Sister Penelope, that he is yeah. giving them a window into his spiritual state much more readily. Well, and not only his spiritual state, but also his emotional state. Yeah, and I don't think that he had a whole lot of avenues for emotional openness. I don't think that that was particularly there in the Inklings. I imagine some of it was there. Um, I think Joy Davidman really kind of comes in and opens him up from behind his frozen, you know, Great Antarctica. And I don't think that he can be emotionally altogether honest um, in his house. He couldn't tell Warney about his attachment to Mrs. Moore. And here's this atheist woman um, with whom he has had a very strange relationship. And he can't be, I think, altogether honest with her. And so I think that the tenderness and the spirituality and the wisdom, and frankly, the saintliness of Don Giovanni kind of opens some w- doors and windows for Lewis that uh, he doesn't experience elsewhere. Six months later, Lewis sends a reply opening with an apology, having realized that he hadn't responded to the last letter. We had a couple of these (laughs) with letters to an American lady. He writes, I have just found in my desk the letter which you so kindly wrote at Easter this year. I think I've sent you no reply. Nothing could be less civil than this silence of mine. Nothing less human. I acknowledge my Mm. fault. I ask pardon. 
but I do not wish you to believe either that your memory has fallen from my mind or that your name has fallen from my daily prayers. Mm-hmm. I might steal this. <laughs> Usually <laughs> I, I forget. You, ca- you can't write that every time you don't respond to one of my text <laughs> messages or emails. <laughs> you, you need that on autocomplete on your phone. <laughs> I think I have sent no reply. Nothing could be less civil than the silence of mine. Nothing less human. I acknowledge my fault. I ask pardon. I feel like if anyone receives that, they've got to chuckle. Um, instead of me like doing my major apologies, um, I don't even try to create excuses out of time. I'm just like, I just missed this. Um, I just completely forgot to respond. Um, but I like this a lot. Hmm. <laughs> That's great. It, interestingly, Lewis cites Assidia as one of the seven deadly sins which affects him the strongest. And he mm-hmm. says, Few believe this. And honestly, I am one of them. Andrew, what's Assidia? And what do you make of this claim? It's sloth. Mm -hmm. It's laziness. And um, I actually believe in his claim, although he was always quite busy and and accomplished a great deal, because you hear a similar claim in um, Dr. Johnson and Samuel Johnson. And Samuel Johnson was responsible for loads of writing. And I think that probably it's not so much a sign of how Lewis is in terms of his slothfulness. But I think that he is more and more keenly aware of his own faults. And so in the same way that the great saints, the, uh, the closer that they get to, uh, to holiness, the more they feel their own shortcomings. I think that this is probably true of Lewis too. Um, I'm not really quite sure exactly how he would have wasted his time. Um, but <laughs> I think he's keenly aware of it. So I'll accept it at face value. I think it also shows the battle that he was fighting. I think he was feeling the impulse to mm-hmm. not respond to letters, the impulse not to bother writing oh, another book, sure. the impulse not to listen to another boring essay by an undergraduate. Yeah. I'm about to listen to an essay that begins, Swift was born, uh, famously from <laughs> Dr. Dimple in that hideous strength. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that he's owning up to his own kind of um, his own shortcoming. And, you know, he really did push himself very hard. He was very dutiful, almost codependent, I think, sometimes. Um, And that kind of pushing of himself day after day, year after year, especially with not as much diversion around um, Minto's, like I said, you know, the, the household is at quarrel. Um, Warney didn't like Minto, and so um, and Charles, who kind of single-handedly saved the Inklings, I think, um, is gone. Um, so yeah, I think that um, I think that he's uh, I think that he's really aware of of kind of his own shortcoming here. I thought the way that he signed off this letter was particularly interesting, and and there's mm. there's hints of Greek mythology in this. He says, "Farewell, my father, and of your fatherly charity, cease not to make mention of me before our common lord." true God mm-hmm. and the only true man mm-hmm. for all we others since the fall of Adam are but half men. Yeah. And, and that reference to half men, I, I, I see an echo in there of Greek mythology, which has in one of the myths, it's the idea that we were all originally two people and then we were sort of like cut in half and that's sort of what you're doing when you're finding a soulmate. Mm. Mm. Okay. But what do you make of that idea? True God and only true man. Well, certainly, you know, I mean, uh, he is the only true man. I also think of the very last line of the last letter where um, he calls himself cut in half, mm. um, having lost Joy Davidman. It's a different word, but he, I think he senses this, this his own inadequacy and, and longs, for, you know, longs for some of the, the redemption of that. Just, it's just that blurring of Christian and pagan ideas. I love it. I was super clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Well, it's always there. And that's, you mentioned how he sneaks in, you know, the Bible uh, or the, you know, his prayer life. That's the, that's one of the things I find most compelling about Lewis's style is everything, well, Barfield said it. What Lewis Mm -hmm. thought about anything is secretly present in what he said about everything. And so all of that stuff is in there. And there's kind of baked in layers and layers and layers of, um, of, of loads of great writing. So on to letter 12. This is another one from Verona, Mm -hmm. from uh, St. Giovanni. And this one is rather sweet. Don Giovanni Mm. hadn't heard from Lewis for a while. We know why, because of the previous letter. He says, ah, I never responded to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Giovanni was afraid for Lewis. 
He says, the consolation from your letter, which I have lately received, was most welcome to me. For many months after your letter, I longed to receive some news from you. I was afraid mm. lest your health had failed. Now I give thanks mm. to God for your restoration to strength. And I pray the goodness of God uh, that he will grant you many years in which you may be able to work to the glory of God and the salvation of the brethren. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It's like restored to strength. All right, now go, to, go, go out to work. <laughs> <laughs> and he speaks about God having a special mission for Lewis. Mm. Uh, and he also riffs off Jack's half men comment uh, at the end of the previous letter, pointing out that, um, you know, it's only because we have a great high priest Christ who suffers with, with us and sustains us that we can do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he again makes a reference to the crucified one. And he ends with another beautiful sign off, which I, I don't think I'm going to read, but it's well worth stealing. I think one thing I might actually do is I might create a web page with all of the little sign offs that they give. Uh, yeah. So if whenever anyone is writing a letter, if you want a good ending, you can just go and copy and paste what either Don Giovanni or C.S. Lewis said. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I completely missed that. It seems like both letter 10 and letter 12 were not from Lewis. Mm -hmm. I just was reading them. I just kind of assumed they were because I thought Lewis said the crucified one. Yeah, yeah, and now I just looked and know this was done. So, so you're that hasty that you made that mistake, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Not am I. I, I did the same thing with these. <laughs> um, but like, so here's another litany of beautiful stuff. But I guess this isn't from Lewis. This is from Don Giovanni. I always have you in mind. Certainly, you seem to me to be called to a special mission for the good of your neighbor. At this hour, in these difficult times, divine providence demands from us that compelled by love, we openly carry the gospel in our daily life so that others may see our works and glorify the Father. I love that. The gifts of mind and heart, which are your strength, the place which you hold among your students, that should have been the giveaway, are sufficiently <laughs> clear signs of God's will in respect of yourself. God expects from you that by word and deed, you will firmly and gently bring brethren to the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. Without him, we can do nothing, but we can do all things in him who strengthens us. Mm -hmm. And I think when I, when I look here, what's really beautiful too is it seems like he's getting Lewis's mission as well. Remember at the beginning, I mean, he comes on kind of like, let's try to find common ground and, and just do ecumenical conversation. And I haven't seen any of that since the beginning. And it's mm. like he recognizes Lewis as a different calling. Yeah. But also he's, he's doing what Lewis said. One, one of the chief uh, works of ecumenism is getting to know one another. And, yes. and, and rallying around the mere Christianity, which we share, the common Lord, which we share, and forging mm -hmm. bonds of charity in the hope mm -hmm. that these bonds of charity will precede the reconciliation at the uh, governmental and doctrinal yeah. levels of the church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's kind of what we talked about at the beginning. Um, when I um, oppose another, somebody of another Christian tradition, um, do I think as much good as I can of them, or do I allow myself to think much bad? Do I dwell more often on what we um, what we disagree about, or do I dwell most often on what we agree about? And uh, sadly, um, it's uh, I think very much it's it's the latter, and it's so it's nice to see them not disputing about things. Lewis just a few years earlier, in fact, Actually, it's probably right around this time, uh, maybe even a couple of years in the future, the, pr the preface to Mere Christianity, Lewis talks about not talking about the Blessed Virgin and only emphasizing those things that all Christians share. And he says, you know, you can't take from my silence my opinion about these things. I just don't want to get into this controversial thing. And so, um, and it, I think it's human nature, especially religious nature, to say, um, who's not us, and then what What do we disagree with, or what are the differences, and why are we superior? Instead of saying, please tell me, tell me about your devotion to the Virgin, or tell me about predestination, and how does that help you? You know, how does the, the how do the five points of Calvinism really help you understand the sovereignty and goodness of God? So even if I don't agree with somebody, um, to ask them is an act of charity, to listen might be an act of growing maturity and, and, and actually growing theology. Um, one of the things that I found while teaching at Catholic high school is that all of the Catholic doctrines that to me seemed so difficult before 
once I really explored them, especially with kind friends, um, I found uh, I found a real reasonable basis for all of them, and it also made me better friends. And so I think that this friendship that they model is a really good one of saying, "Hey, why do you feel so strongly about that?" Especially in the political season, if I meet somebody who I disagree with, ask them. I should ask them. You know, tell me why you're so passionate about that. Um, what what's what's your story? You know. Mary Oliver says, tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. And you know what's interesting, speaking to that, what you, tr- you usually find out is not only is it not malice, typically mm-hmm. people's motivation is a goodness. It's just not fully understanding the best way to express that love, that compassion, that goodness. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so, yeah, when you meet someone, it's like we both have a common ground that we want what's best for humanity. We really want life to be good and beautiful and people to be thriving. It's just a question of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Almost every atheist I know was somebody who was hurt by the church. Almost no atheist I've ever met kind of reasoned their way there. And so finding out about a person's pains and talking about my own and, you know, joining each other for the wish for healing for those things, I think can do an enormous amount of good. That's not bad Lenten practice. Here we are at the end of Lent or middle of Lent. A few months later, Lewis replies to this letter. And it seems that another letter from another Italian gentleman was sent to Lewis, but Jack couldn't make any sense of it, describing <laughs> it wonderfully as a Sibylline book. So this is a reference to the obscure prophecies. Uh, Lewis uh, then makes the request through Don Giovanni, uh, which I, I realized as I was writing it, it was like, oh, saintly intercession just on earth. Uh, but he makes a request through Don Giovanni uh, that, to, to ask the man to write either in English or Latin. And if he has to use Italian, could he please use a typewriter? And as someone who hates reading <laughs> cursive, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. And yeah. at the end of this letter, he points out that Jesus took on all our miseries except old age, meaning that mm. in the one true man, who we referred to earlier, lives youth everlasting. And uh, that should be encouraging for you, Matt, you know, because, you know, he was, he, was, he was in his 30s when, when he was crucified. So you technically count oh, as youth, it. although it's oh, not yeah. everlasting. It's slipping away very, very quickly. Uh, yes. I'm looking ahead at this next letter. I had nothing on this letter, but I'm looking ahead at the next one. It's just making me chuckle. Well, I missed yeah. that it's it's from Don Giovanni again. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that in, in the heading just above it, I put Verona. <laughs> so this letter that you're talking about, it was sent by Don Giovanni in Advent of 1949. What are your notes on this? Actually, before we do, I just want two things about the previous letter. Um, I loved that phrase, weakened as we are by age and the long habit of sinning. And then, uh, I rejoice that the Lord who took upon him all our other miseries willed not to take old age. Um, And I wonder if, because you see the old King Caspian, when he goes through the river and comes back in Athens country, is about 33. And so I wonder if heavenly age is about early 30s you know, like our Lord was when he died. Um, and the, the thought that Jesus didn't take on the, the trouble of old age, you know, I just, uh, fascinating ideas. And these kind of throwaway quotes that, uh, that you know, contain a lot of decent, um, uh, a lot of things to think about. Anyway, yeah, on to the next. <laughs> so what was so funny is, I still think Lewis has a saint-like disposition. But I am realizing three of the letters where I'm like, this is so beautiful. It sounds like a saint was actually the saint. <laughs> and so I really miss that one. Um, like Here's just what I'll read and then some of the stuff. I feel myself joined by a close, sweet bond. I just thought that was really beautiful expression, mm. vulnerable, tender, authentic. But then he says, let us pray for one another that the longing of Christ may be filled, fulfilled as soon as possible. And let all of us from the Christian family labor to bring it about that brethren dwell together in unity. Let us all walk in newness of life so that by the light of our life's example, we may draw to the flock of Christ into yielding good fruit. All those who through either negligence or prejudiced opinions have strayed from the way. So, so things that just stuck out to me, longing of Christ, dwell together, labor, newness of life and unity. I mean, there's just a lot of beautiful themes wrapped up in that. I mean, mm-hmm. he really was, had a saint-like disposition. 
And you can tell he read a lot of Paul's epistles. His letters yeah. in mm. particular yeah. come to me uh, as very Pauline. L- lots of turns of phrase, same sorts of imagery. And also the Psalms, you know, and so it's, uh, what is it, Psalm 133? It's all Greek to me. <laughs> Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell to, to dwell in unity. And the Psalms are such a consistent part of the, um, of the monastic life. Mm-hmm. So it's now Lewis's turn to be grateful for a break in radio silence. On a letter dated the 13th of September 1951, he writes... I was moved with unaccustomed joy by your letter, and all the more because I had heard you were ill. Sometimes I feared lest you had perhaps died. But never in the least did I cease from my prayers for you, for not even the river of death ought to abolish the sweet intercourse of love and meditations. Now I rejoice because I believe you are well, or are at least better. Here we've got yet another example of him beautifully mixing together Christianity and paganism. He's talking about the river Styx. He says, ah, even that can't separate it. The Pauline version of that is, I'm convinced yeah. neither height nor depth nor death can separate us from the love of Christ. That there, that there is a connection between yes. believers because we are members of the same body. Yeah. And he, he also includes a, a, little, a little note about not condemning the body, reminding uh, Don Giovanni, the, <laughs> reminding the Catholic priest about what St. Francis said about Brother Ass. In addition to the paganism, what Lewis is very carefully doing is, is speaking about Italian literature, right? Francis is Italian, all of uh, this, Dante. you know, the, 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 you know, some of the, you know, some of the stuff that he's referring to comes from, you know, comes from stuff written, written in Italy. Um, the actual tale that he gets, um, the book is Lentano del Pianet- Pianeta Silenziosa. So um, the book that he gets is Out of the Silent Planet. Ah, wonderful. And St. Gio- Giovanni, by the way, is uh, born in 1873. So at this point, he is 50, f- uh, I'm sorry, um, 74 or so. So he is drawing towards the end of his life. And Lewis closes this letter by wishing him blessings on his 50th year as a priest. And he ends by saying, may we always pray for one another, both in this world and in the world to come. Which was Mm. the quotation which began today's episode. Wonderful. I think that we could learn a lot from Lewis's prayers just by compiling the quotes that he has about them in his letters. On Boxing Day of 1951, and that's December 26th for you Americans, Jack writes to St. Giovanni saying, a great joy has befallen me. (laughs) That's a very interesting way of describing it. What's this great joy, Matt? The forgiveness of sins. He fell into believing it. And he, he says, for a long time, I believed that I believed in the forgiveness of sins, but suddenly on St. Mark's day, this truth appeared in my mind, so clear a light that I perceive that never before... Had I believed it with my whole heart, mm. and you know, and I and, and I put first of all, he wonders if it was due to the intercessions of the Father, which I love, and I think that's just such an honor to offer that to him. Potentially, we we you would never know who it is from, but I think that's wonderful. But I just love too how in life we really just need to pray for God's graces, and in many areas, like just to continue to pray for Him to transform our heart. We can intellectually forgive someone. Um, overcome certain sins. We can try to do the best of our abilities, but like nothing just beats entering into prayer and communion. So I just, I really love that. The other thing I think about this forgiveness, he talks about it for years to come. Um, and then in 1963, right before he dies, he, he mentions, do you know, only a few weeks ago, I realized suddenly that I had at, at last had forgiven the cruel schoolmaster who so darkened my childhood. I'd been trying to do it for years. And like you, each time I thought I'd done it, or I I found after a week or so that it all had to be attempted over again. But this time I feel sure it is the real thing. And I think that this is just such a great spiritual concept because 10 years earlier, 12 years earlier, Lewis begins to really understand that he is forgiven. And then it takes him more than another decade (laughs) to fully forgive others. But I think that the two are somehow paired. And that if I'm struggling to forgive someone else, maybe I should also struggle 
primarily to understand the great forgiveness that comes at the cross. Um, and so I think this is operative in Lewis's life and his mention of it here for with John, Don Giovanni is the first, but it goes on echoing throughout the next, um, the, for throughout the rest of his life for the next 15 years or so. Hmm. And it does show his persistence because in this letter, he, he says that this is, I've, I've finally come to believe in the forgiveness of sins. And this is after many of my confessions and many absolutions that I've received. So he's been going through the process, but something changed. The The grace finally broke through into a, 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 a deeper part of his soul for him to truly believe the substance of it. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, let me ask you guys your questions on this next paragraph in here. He's talking about sin, and particularly it sounds like St. Don Giovanni has been very forthright potentially with some of his sin, struggles, suffering. Mm-hmm. We don't know what those are. But he says, it is this, you write much about your own sins. Beware, then in parentheses, permit me, my dearest father, to say beware, end of that, lest humility should pass over into anxiety or sadness. It is bidden us to rejoice and always rejoice. Jesus has canceled the handwriting which was against us. Lift up our hearts. Mm-hmm. I'm curious your guys' thoughts on... Let's just assume for the sake of this conversation, the most extreme, some sort of like repeat sin, something that not just like sometimes it's, you know, falling into these different things, that little thing, but like truly a repeat type of sin um, that constantly going to his confessor for and trying to work through. What's that process of here? You don't want to, I don't want to rejoice in my sin um, per se, but, you know, what is that balance of, guilt or humility, but rejoicing, but being a little bit anxious over wanting to overcome these things. Like, what do you guys make of this? <laughs> I think that one of the things that happens with forgiveness um, and experiencing God's forgiveness has a lot to do with how we experience it in time. And we've been talking about this in my mere Christianity class on Sundays, which we broadcast from the church, um, how God stands outside of time and sees us as fully forgiven, right? He only sees the sacrifice of his son. He is not frustrated with us. I'm frustrated with myself all the time. And I'm sure others are frustrated with me and I get frustrated with other people, but God doesn't experience that because it is a finished act. And so this idea of struggling with sin um, for a lifetime one of the key elements, I think, at least in my own spiritual life and you know, as I minister to others, is to remind myself that although I get tired of repenting, God doesn't get tired of hearing it. And God doesn't ever roll his eyes and say, oh, are you, are, did you fall to that one again? And now are you coming and making a poor mouth again about this sin that you've been doing since you were a teenager or whatever? Um, God doesn't have that gear. And he sees us as fully forgiven. Um, And so some of that is an invitation to look up from my life and to stand out of the temporal situation and to see things from God's perspective, that the finished work of the cross means that I'm not running out of chances or running out of tries or running out of God's patience. God's patience was fully satisfied at the cross. And if I apply that to me, and if I think as lightly in one sense of my sins as God does, I'll be in a far better spiritual uh, position. Sometimes I get so frustrated and it's just like, God's like, yeah, but I already forgave that. And I'm like, yeah, but this time I did it. And he's like, yeah, but I already forgave that. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. But at least, you know, and the tendency is to to sit in the the middle of our own sense of it instead of taking God's perspective. And um, so in terms of those long-term sins, I would say, keep reminding yourself Let's keep reminding ourselves of how God thinks about our sin. He doesn't see it. He has separated us from the, from them as far as the East is from the West. And that was before the cross that, uh, that that came in the scriptures. I find it hard to work out how a legitimate warning this actually is for Don Giovanni. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, if you read some of Lewis's writings, sometimes I want to give him a very similar sort of warning uh, in terms <laughs> of like, mm, watch yourself there, Jack. But I will also say this is something that is 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 runs throughout Christianity. It's it's something of a Chesterton paradox in terms of that we we do pay 
particular attention to our sinfulness, but then also to the goodness of God. Yeah. When we confess, our sins are forgiven, and we should detest our sins to dry to 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 summon our will to cooperate with the grace that's given with us, uh, given to us, so that we don't fall into it again. But we also have to remind ourselves that everything is by grace, and so I, I think it's it's a it's a paradox we often find ourselves in, and. I, I think the chief thing is to ne- never get out of balance. If if I only think about my own sins yeah. and not about the grace of God, then I'm in big trouble. If I only think about the grace of God, there is a danger there as well that I might then start uh, mm-hmm. committing the sin of presumption and thinking very lightly of my sins. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. This Lent, I've been praying the chapter of Saint Charbel. He is a huge saint for for the Lebanese community, and this is a line of one of the opening prayers: "Many are my sins, but greater is your mercy." When placed on a scale, your mercy prevails over the weight of the mountains known only to you. Consider the sin and consider the atonement. The atonement is greater and exceeds the sin. Your beloved son sustained the nails and the lance because of my sins. So in his sufferings, you are satisfied and I live. So it's a, it's a bringing together of, of, of my contrition and uh, Christ's offering and, and satisfaction for my sins. Yeah. The only distinction I would make, and it's something that my bishop talked about when he came to um to our for his parochial visit, for his visit to our parish. We our sins are you said when I confess my sins are forgiven, but my sins are actually forgiven before I confess them. And so my confession is not a response to my sin. My confession or my repentance is a response to God's grace. So the forgiveness comes first, and then when I look at that appalling forgiveness in light of my own sinfulness, then I confess in light of God's unmerited favor abounding over me and the blood of Christ which covers me, rather than going, oh boy, I better pull that blanket up again. And that's how I felt about it early in my Christian life, that any sin that I that I committed was going to be on me until I confessed it. But when I confess, I enact the grace that is already there. Experientially, it happens differently, but it's a response, I think, to the gospel, not a, a way to earn the gospel. In Catholic theology, you make a distinction between perfect and imperfect contrition. Uh, okay. Imperfect contrition is I'm confessing because I don't want to be punished. Mm-hmm. Perfect contrition is I'm confessing because I know that my sin offends God. It's for the, it's mm-hmm. for the love of God that I'm confessing my sin. So we would, we would make a slight distinction on that as well as kind of how you, how you, how you, at least how you sort of work out the chronology. But those those, those are deep theological waters. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's get on to letter seventeen. This is one mm-hmm. from Jack. It's sent on the fourteenth of April, and he notifies John Giovanni of the death of the Anglican priest to whom Lewis had been going to for confession and from whom he'd received spiritual direction. And it's mm-hmm. really quite moving. And so, Andrew, since, since you're the uh, Episcopal priest, do you want to read that bit? This is of Father Walter Adams, who was a priest at St. Saint, uh, Mary, Saint Mary Maudlin um, in Oxford. It's right by the Martyrs Memorial. It's not Maudlin College. There's a tiny little church, and you can still go in there. And Lewis would go there weekly for confessions from Father, to, for, to, for confession with Father Adams. Here's what Lewis says to St. Giovanni. I feel very much an orphan because my aged confessor and most loving father in Christ has just died. While he was celebrating at the altar, suddenly, after a most sharp but, thanks be to God, brief attack of pain, very brief attack of pain, he expired. And his last words were, I come, Lord Jesus. He was a man of ripe spiritual wisdom, noble-minded, but of an almost childlike simplicity and innocence, buono fanciulo, buono fanciulo, if I may put it so. So he's borrowing the phrase of a, of, of St. Giovanni's um, community, of being like the, the community of the good children. Mm. Quite a way to go while you're on the altar. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know much about his relationship with Father Adams, and I think he wrote a couple of books, um, but that uh, that's shrouded in mystery. Part of why Lewis went to confession is because he really didn't want to. 
<laughs> he found it appalling. Um, uh, that's, that's a really good spiritual barometer test. It's like, do I want to get a confession? Don't want to. Okay, I probably need to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. I want to just say something here, it, connecting to our last season of Wisdom of Death, which is such a big theme and something I've found really beautiful. This might be my version. I probably also need what Lewis said of finally feeling true forgiveness. But I feel like something that I struggle with is the wisdom of death. I definitely have a fear of death. And I learn this any single time that I'm in an airplane. I was flying back from Washington, D.C. It was rough turbulent. Mm. And I'm just like, honestly, praying a rosary kind of internally. I'm not externally showing any kind of like fear, but internally I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like <laughs> genuinely scary. And, uh, it, it, and there's been seasons in my life where I feel really intimately in communion with God that that hasn't scared me one bit. I'm like, I'm ready to go down if this goes down. This is not one of those seasons. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't know if this is just a litmus test for me, but it's something I really need to pray for. I mean, I should honestly, to be blunt, and it sounds terrible to say, I mean, I have soon to be married and in dependencies and stuff in life, but it's like, oh, whoa, I get to be in communion with God. This could be like the greatest grace in the world coming here, but that is not what I think. Mm -hmm. I would suggest reading uh, the opening chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians because he speaks about how he's he's torn. He's, mm -hmm. He says that he wants to stay and minister to, to the Philippians, but he also wants to be with Christ. And that's where the famous line, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's like, it's win-win. It's win-win. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I think that part of the change might be, I think God has called you to a new apostolate, to be mm. a husband and perhaps uh, a father. And you have much good to do in Mary Margaret's life. And you may have very much good to do if the Lord sees fit to provide you with children. And if he does, that's a huge legacy to live. Even the the idea of, of living with a wife, that is... The act is the is the the highest symbol of God's love for the church, right? He uses that symbol as his own relationship with us. And so you're entering into this season where somebody's really going to need you and need you to be around. And so perhaps that's your spirit um understanding what your circumstance is is developing. Mm. It it's does a charitable way it. of looking at it. I appreciate that, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say it's just because you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> or or more worse off, it's just because I'm afraid of where I'm going afterwards. <laughs> In this letter, there is also uh, a sign that Lewis's memory wasn't always perfect. He asks uh, Don Giovanni where the, where the line comes from that says, love is a fire continually burning. And he says, I think it's in the imitation of Christ, but I can't find it. It was in the imitation of Christ. So I find that very comforting that although his memory was incredible, it wasn't perfect. He may have forgotten it or he may it may have been a generous question, right? He may have been inviting um, St. Giovanni to share. But yeah, he may have, you know, he had so much in his head that, you know, it's hard to track everything down. <laughs> He ends the letter by saying that they all may be one is a petition which in my prayers I never admit. While the wished for unity of doctrine and order, that was the word I was looking for, order, not governance. Uh, the, the wished for unity of doctrine and order is missing. All the more eagerly let us try to keep the bond of charity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we have another letter in July. And I don't really have a whole lot to say about this one. Uh, it's clear that Don Giovanni has again been waxing on the dire state of the times in which we're living. And uh, Lewis gives his characteristically refreshing response. What is it, Matt? The times we live in are, as you say, grave. Whether graver than all others is in history, I do not know. If that day is indeed approaching now, what remains but that we should rejoice because our redemption is now nearer and say with St. John, Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Again, just like saint-like disposition, wisdom of death, rejoice. I mean, mm -hmm. that is that is right there what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and in some ways, I think that Lewis's saintliness um, increases because he's spending time conversing with a future saint, right? And mm -hmm. that's, you know, Lewis's tone elevates. And so um, that's also good to think about, you know, bad company ruins good morals you know who's who do i admire whose approach do i admire and and um how am i spending time 
learning from them. The only other thing that I'd say about this letter, um, the evil that is closest always seems to be the most serious, seems to me another incident of chronological snobbery. We think that our age has gone to hell and that other ages were so much better in the past. But in truth, all ages have a combination of good and evil. And so he's seeing that even though it seems like it's the worst, you know, even the evil that is closest seems most serious, um, it's good to take some perspective and go, well, people have, have often felt this way. Certainly there are some terrible ages and some terrible things um, that occur. But, um, but Lewis looking up from his own age um, I think is a helpful perspective. And Screwtape says that their goal is to always have people running around uh, seeking the opposite virtues that they should do during each time period of time. There's also echoes of uh, living in an atomic age in these sorts of comments. Uh, we, have, we have the temptation to think that our age is unique. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you read lots of old books, you find that's not really true. Hmm. The next letter comes on the Feast of the Three Kings, so the Magi, in January of 1953. Don Giovanni, he makes mention of an article in a magazine which Lewis is unable to find, and we'll hear more about that in the next letter. And Jack asked Don Giovanni to pray for his next project, uh, which is what will later become known as Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. And Lewis explains its goal. It's, 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 a, it's a book on prayer, for new converts. He says there are some wonderful books of prayer out there, but they're all they're all kind of advanced. I, I want to I want to give a book for someone that say recently become a Christian. Uh, it, it's as usual, Lewis addressing needs as he sees them. It, it's like the, uh, the opening preface of mere Christianity. There the line was thinnest, and to it I naturally went. Mm -hmm. It's actually this this book, um, he talks about it in 1955 in that famous letter that I quote all the time to Carl F. H. Henry where he talks about catching the reader unawares through fiction and symbol. He says, I'll write no more direct theology. The last work of that sort that I attempted, I had to abandon. And so there's about 120 pages or something of a book on prayer. And you can see the manuscript at the Wade Center. And he just couldn't get it done. And it's not until he marries Joy Davidman that he's able to actually write letters to Malcolm chiefly on prayer. So the, the thing that he, that he tries to write is more discursive. Um, and the thing that he ends up writing is this kind of epistolary. He, mm -hmm. he writes a series of letters. There isn't really a Malcolm. Um, and so, but this, this idea that he's trying, um, he, he fails at. And that's just part of some of the last failures of his life before Joy comes on the scene. And once again, Joy helps him find the form for work, as she did with a certain other book, which will remain nameless. <laughs> because its name is so famous. <laughs> Matt, you told me that the, the next bit was probably your favorite section of the entire letter collection. <laughs> it's, I think a lot of people who have spent time trying to discern in life, whether it's a career discernment, whether it's a personal discernment, whatever it is, this wisdom is so incredible. Pray for me, my father, that I neither persist through overboldness in what is not permitted to me nor withdraw through great through too great timidity from due effort. For he who touches the ark without authorization, and he who having once put his hand to the plow, draws it back, are both lost. Mm. I mean, this is this is at yeah. the core of discernment. I mean, how often we need to this is this is like just business advice too. I listen to some of the greatest investors and they're like strong opinions loosely held. Like you can't you can't work in business without making strong opinions and in, in action. I mean, you need those things, but you also can't hold to them too boldly, but you can't just waver in the wind as well back and forth. So that's just, it's so good. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's part of Lewis's genius to grab two really disparate examples, different examples, and to cram them together in order to find wisdom. Um, and he does this in the scriptures here. Um, so he's combining the, you know, touching of the ark and the Hebrew scriptures and, and Jesus' statement about removing your hand from the plow. But he also does this with, with literature. And so he grabs examples from so many different eras and genres in order to express his point. And that's just a, that mind to, at work is just a, um, is just a marvel to behold. And I don't know anything about doing that sort of thing. 
We end our letters for this episode with one that was sent just two days later. There's actually a third one that comes very soon afterwards, but we'll come to that next time. Uh, The magazine containing the article previously mentioned has turned up, and it relates to some Chinese disaster. And Lewis says that he had once entertained high hopes for China due to the constant missionary work there, but he, he sees its decline and accompanied with many persecutions and miseries. Interestingly, though, in that section, he switches to the first person plural. He says, nor was this misery absent from our thoughts and prayers, which I'm pretty certain has to be a reference to Warney, particularly given the time that he spent in in the East and the heart that he had for it. However, Lewis then pivots and says something which I didn't expect. He says, when he's speaking about uh, what's, what's happening in China, he says, it did not happen, however, without sins on our part. For that justice and that care of the poor which the communists advertised, we in reality ought to have brought about ages ago. We Westerners preach Christ with our lips, but with our actions we brought on the slavery of mammon. Mm. And he looks at the history of Europe and the horrible things committed by those who claim the name Christian and asked, who could detect any but the rarest traces of the Holy Spirit? which might be a little depressing, but I do think it's not a bad tone to end on during this Lenten episode. Well, and David, I'll fill in the gap there a little bit of uh, between the two quotes you read, because it's, it's a very piercing thing that he says coming here. We are more guilty than the infidels. For to those that know the will of God and do it not, the greater the punishment. Now, the only refuge lies in contrition and prayer. Long have we erred in reading the history of Europe it's destructive succession of war, of avarice, of fatricidal persecutions of Christians by Christians, of luxury, of gluttony, of pride. I mean, it's just that that packs a punch. And you know, one thing I wonder as I go through these is you, you've met people in life like this. I don't. I'm not making a moral judgment one way or the other. I think life needs both of them. I think Lewis is more of a nuanced person, a gray area, recognizes, he recognizes truth can be black and white, but the implementation of it can be pretty messy. And I feel like Father, the priest here, is a bit more just of a black and white, good and evil. And Lewis just tries to human humanize everything. So you know, the priest is just like, communism bad, the other way good. Lewis is like, well, the other way actually can be quite dangerous too. Yes, communism mm-hmm. is bad, but like, let's look at this. And I've seen this in many other areas of this as well, where Lewis kind of pushes back a little bit and provides nuance. He's not diluting truth mm-hmm. in the slightest, but he's recognizing humanity is really messy and it's just not always super clear. So this is a really important letter as well, because Lewis is often um, charged with uh, racism um, uh, and uh, he's acknowledging the damages done by imperialism here. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's uh, people often see Lewis as just kind of thoughtless towards the Western, you know, especially British imperialism that really destroyed so many lives in the name of money, right? The missionaries and the, and the, and the, um, the spice companies worked hand in hand. Um, and sometimes the missionaries were taken advantage of by the, uh, by the corporations, by the companies. Um, but there was, there was a complicity there, and some of the real negatives and damages done by imperialism were done in the name of Christ and with the cooperation of at least some members of the church. And I think it's very helpful for Lewis to acknowledge um, the sins of the church. And it's not an insight that most people assume that Lewis has. And so this is one of those passages that um, I think can be, can be you know, really, really handily kind of tossed into the conversation when people dismiss him too quickly. Uh, about how he responds to such matters. And rather appropriate that he's just sent in the Italian version of Out of the Silent Planet, which is also a critique of that sort of activity. Yeah, exactly. There are, West- there are Westerns everywhere. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Just another series of great letters, great prose, great advice. You know, it's a joy. Oh, and I, um, uh, I'm putting together my C.S. Lewis conference, April 26th and 27th at our parish in Winter Garden, Florida. By the time this comes out, registration will be available. So maybe we'll link to that. But I bring it up because Sophia Holcomb, who's been a guest here before, um, is reading Latin, loving Latin. And when I had a meeting with her and a few others the other night, she's like, when did the Latin letters come out? When do you guys put those out? Did they come out tomorrow? So she was very excited about that. And uh, <laughs> it's a joy to be to be making our way through them. 
Well, I hear the call for final drinks. So thanks to our sound engineers, Taylor and Sarah, our intern, Julia. Thanks to all of our listeners and patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Mary Margaret Bush, to be. Aldo, James, <laughs> Matt, Erica, Joel, Amanda, Thomas, Bud1, Bud2, Shane, K, Paul, Gary, Stephen, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, Angela, and Rowdy. Pray for you all every single time a new episode drops, particularly for our prayer request Slack channel. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. Adiatus nos si placet in proximo episodio. Ubi perdemos ire et porro altius. Et porro entres, entren secas. <laughs> Valete. 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 Cheers. <laughs>